Now begins a story of heroism and devotion to duty that you were never taught in school. It begins and ends here at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, with the dedication of this monument to a name that stirs a faint sense of recognition, a slight jarring in some remote corner of the mind. The story of a faithful band of brothers who gloried in the name given to them by the very enemies they fought, the Buffalo Soldiers. Thousands from across the country make the pilgrimage to Kansas to hear an address by the man whose dream sparked this dedication more than 10 years ago. General Colin Powell, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. America's highest ranking officer here to honor a group of men that no one knows. Nameless, faceless ghosts from the mists of frontier history until now. During the Civil War, they were called the U.S. Colored Troops. Nearly 180,000 fought for the Union. 33,000 died. Thousands more fought for the South. But now the war was over. Many drifted west to become farmers, cowboys, settlers. In 1866, the new standing army announced some startling additions. Two regiments of cavalry, two of infantry, all black troops with white officers. For most of those guys, it was a dream come true. No more cotton fields, no more factories. Thirteen hard cash dollars every month. Regular meals, a uniform. A chance to be somebody. Pushed into a dark corner of our past, exactly 100 years went by before this story was told. In 1967, Dr. William Lecky wrote the first and still the definitive history of the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the Buffalo Soldiers. One thing that I, I, I don't believe many people realize, that we only had 10 regiments of cavalry. Two of those regiments were black. That's 20%. That's one calorie one in five is black. They spent from 1867 to 1891 in efforts to bring peace and order on a frontier that stretched from the Canadian border to the Mexican border, from the Rocky Mountains to the Prairie Plain. And they were the principal line of defense in a huge, huge, huge area. The tragedy is they never got any credit for it. As the glamour outfits, the cavalry took the forefront. Two of the Army's best officers were assigned to command. Colonel Edward Hatch, the 9th Cavalry, and Colonel Benjamin Grierson took the job of organizing the 10th Regiment. The problems were many. Untrained, mostly illiterate ex-slaves and no officers to train them. Assignment to a black unit was not perceived as a career-enhancing move. The troopers knew it, too. Here's an ad in the Army-Navy Journal. A first lieutenant of infantry stationed at a very desirable post desires a transfer with an officer of the same grade on equal terms if in a white regiment. But if in a colored regiment, a reasonable bonus would be expected. Even General Custer said no thanks. I don't want to serve with no brunettes. That's what he called us, brunettes. We've been called worse. But the Great Plains were under siege. Comanches, Kiowa, Cheyenne, Sioux, and Arapaho warriors struck all across Kansas and Indian Territory. In the summer of 1867, Colonel Grierson and his raw recruits of the 10th Cavalry rode into battle. Their job? To protect workers building the Kansas Pacific Railroad. The first public mention of these new troops in combat came in the September 7, 1867 issue of Harper's Weekly, dateline Fort Harker, Kansas. Quote, a few months since, you could not have convinced a ranchman that there was any fight in the colored troops. 
It is different now. I've not met a single frontiersman who has seen the dusky patriots go for the Indians, but be loud in their praise. Why, quoth one of them the other day, plague my cats if they don't like it. After this first successful fight, the sergeant in charge turned in this report. Me and the boys, we done all bully, except Corporal Johnson. He flinked. And the way he flinked was to stay back till we had run the engines about two miles. Then he come hollering, get at him, get at him. Now, me and the boys don't think nobody that flinked like that ought to have no corporal stripes. The tradition of pride in the regiment and themselves had taken root. The troopers also took great pride in their new nickname. For its origin, we return to Dr. Lecky. The Cheyennes saw a resemblance between the hair of that black trooper and the buffalo. It was meant as a compliment. That black trooper understood. He not only liked it, he was proud of it. I interviewed some old Kiowa and Comanche Indians uh, at Anadarko, Oklahoma. And I asked several of them about the origin of the term buffalo so they confirmed what I've just told you. And said, but boy, they were fighters. In later years, the cavalrymen adopted the animal as part of their regimental insignia. They were officially buffalo soldiers. The area on which this magnificent monument stands was not a random choice. Much deeper significance was involved in the final selection. This is sculptor Eddie Dixon. The original site was parade ground. I spoke with an elderly woman that lived in the Fort Leavenworth area that she was a reservoir of history. The area that she thought the soldiers should be placed was in an area near the river. In the earlier part of the history of Fort Leavenworth, this area was very swamp-like. It was a bog area. And the black soldiers weren't allowed to live up on the higher grounds uh, or in the barracks in which they build for the white soldiers. And she stated that many soldiers died down there, many soldiers became very ill. And I selected that site because I thought the key word to everything that she had, uh, had given me, I thought the key to it was the souls of those men are still there. So what would be a better site to place this sculpture than where the souls were still restless moving around? So now I think they will be at ease and at rest. While Grierson and the 10th handled the plains, Colonel Hatch and the 9th Cavalry were ordered to Texas. Indians, Comancheros, rustlers, and Mexican bandits were their foes. Sun, sand, and scorpions, their daily companions. And like the 10th, the 9th Cavalrymen had one more enemy, prejudice, by the very people they were risking their lives to defend. In those days, Texans didn't take kindly to Yanks in uniform. And that went double for blue suits on black troopers. In the little tough towns that developed around these military folks, a black trooper didn't have to look for trouble. When he went to town, it was waiting for him. In 1877, one such incident occurred outside Fort Concho in the rough and tumble town of San Angelo, now San Angelo, Texas. A group of cowboys and hunters confronted a sergeant, cut off his chevrons, the stripes from his trousers, and generally humiliated him. Back at the barracks, troopers hearing the story grabbed their weapons and headed back to the saloon. A massive shootout ensued, killing one buffalo soldier and one of the townspeople. There were reprisals, but the cavalry troopers had made their point. That scene would be repeated many times in the frontier world of the troopers. An ironic footnote. In Indian territory, the 9th Cavalry was there to protect the five so-called civilized tribes against invasions by less domestic Indians. The five tribes were mainly successful farmers, aided greatly by their custom of keeping black slaves. These photographs constitute the largest single accumulation of Buffalo Soldier images ever assembled. 
the result of nearly 20 years of research by Dr. John Langelier, author and military historian. Many have never been published, and they are totally unique. The fact is, these photographs took so long to assemble because they're scattered throughout the country in small historical societies and agencies and sometimes larger collections and private hands. They're extremely rare. The rarity comes from a number of factors, not the least of which is the fact that the soldiers themselves were stationed at remote outposts in many instances and had no access to photographers. In other cases, the soldiers had no real tradition of having their photographs taken. During the days of slavery, this was not an option that they had available to them. Cut off from family and friends in the past, the barracks became their home, their, their comrades, their family, or their adopted family, and thus there was no need to have a photo taken for that reason. Finally, these photos that do exist many times don't even have names associated with them. They're anonymous today, and yet they tell us so much. They are the only documents we have. Unlike other time periods, say the Civil War or even the Spanish-American War, when we have a number of letters and even diary accounts from black troops who had served in those engagements, nothing has survived from the enlisted men's point of view, written by the soldiers themselves, that we can really piece together and get an individual idea of who they are. We also will find that within these photographs, the soldiers themselves were proving something, not to themselves. They had no reason to do that. They knew they were professionals, serving faithfully and with valor. And they didn't have to prove that to their comrades either. And yet they had a certain sense that somehow seems to come through when we look at these individual images of the men that said, we know who we are. We want others to know, not only other African Americans, but the nation as a whole, to know that we are proud soldiers, that we are capable professionals. That's what those photographs tell us. That's why they're so important to us. And that's unfortunately why they're so rare. A detailed exploration of the black military experience on the frontier is difficult, but Fort Davis, Texas provides a microcosm, an isolated universe, one of the many homes of the Buffalo Soldiers. At varying times, both regiments of cavalry and the infantry operated from Fort Davis. And while the cavalry spent most of its time in pursuit of marauding Apaches, Comanches, Comancheros, and bandits, to the infantry fell the less glamorous jobs staffing the garrison, maintaining roads, guarding the stagecoach line, erecting the telegraph systems. More than a hundred years later, mute evidence of their passing remains. The ruts of the Butterfield stage still mark the desert landscape. Stumps of telegraph poles placed by the black troopers jut from the sand. And at this important waterhole, the Tinaja de las Palmas, a battle which helped end the Apache Wars in Texas took place. Digging into the sand above these rock tanks sometimes produced enough water to stay alive. Convinced that Victorio and his warriors would cross the Rio Grande for yet another murderous raid, Colonel Grierson set a trap. His troopers spread dangerously thin by constant patrols. Grierson stationed guards at every waterhole 30 to 50 miles apart. Here in the shadow of the Eagle Mountains, Grierson, his teenage son, and nine men of the 10th Cavalry waited and watched. Victoria, with nearly 100 warriors now desperate for water, entered the valley. Alarmed by the numbers, Grierson sent for reinforcements, and the battle was joined. The stone barricades erected by the troopers still stand exactly as they were in 1882. Fred Moore, a local rancher and historian, discovered the battle site some years ago. I picked up about three or four spent cottages in this area along the wall here, and I found one cottage, live cottage, that hadn't been fired at 4570, so apparently they were held up here, but they didn't do too much firing from this angle because there's some three to four hundred yards over there before the Indians were uh, ported up on that little peak over there, and I did find quite a few empty shells, spent shells along that ridge over there, and I presume they were from the Indians, uh, Good, because uh, uh, according to Grierson's report was when the Indians spied Grierson and his troops up here on the hill while they turned south to try to miss the troops and go south of the state line and that's when the, the troopers took after them over there and the Indians forded up on that ridge over there so that accounts for the spent shells over there I'm sure. 
And uh, as I said, that's the only ones that I found here. And then on that the point up there where Grierson actually was on top, I didn't find anything up there in the way of uh, ammunition or shells or anything. So apparently they didn't fire from up there on account of the distance. After several hours, Victoria retreated north to Rattlesnake Springs, where another buffalo contingent lay in wait. The Apaches were forced back into Mexico, where the war chief was killed in a battle with the Federales. The Apache threat to southwest Texas was over. The United States Military Academy, West Point, New York. The grim expressions on the faces of these cadets are the kind that greeted new cadet Henry O. Flipper when he arrived. Flipper, the first black American ever to graduate from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, was a symbol to the entire black population. He was from Atlanta, and his folks was ex-slaves. When Flipper graduated from West Point in 1877, <laughs> he was our Jackie Robinson, <laughs> Joe Lewis, and Ralph Bunch all rolled into one. He took the silent treatment at school for four years and made it. He proved that we could do it, but we was just like everybody else. It lasted five years. At Fort Davis, Flipper was accused of embezzling regimental funds. Contemporary reports suggest that his biggest crime was going riding with a white lady from the nearby town. Unlike accused white officers who were always confined to their quarters, Flipper was locked up in this guardhouse. The court-martial took place here in the Post Chapel. These are the ruins of the Post Chapel today. This is how it appeared during the court-martial. The verdict was guilty of conduct unbecoming an officer, and Flipper was given a dishonorable discharge, an excessive sentence which for white officers usually brought a brief suspension and loss of pay. Flipper would devote the rest of his life in attempting to overturn the court. Then, just a few years later, another man made it to West Point. John Hanks Alexander of Arkansas, whose parents had also been slaves, graduated in the class of 1887. Duty with the 9th Cavalry, then, while assigned to Wilberforce University, he died of heart disease. In all, only three black Americans in the 19th century graduated from West Point. Charles Young, whose family had moved north from Kentucky after the Civil War, was an outstanding student. He graduated in the class of 1889. When he was still with the 9th, Lieutenant Young volunteered to tutor an ambitious sergeant who wanted to earn a commission. He got that commission and then some. That sergeant was Benjamin O. Davis, Sr. In 1940, he was the first black soldier ever to wear the star of a general. And that family's tradition continued. In 1936, Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. became the first black graduate of West Point in more than 50 years, following the very man who had tutored his father. Davis, Jr., one of World War II's famous Tuskegee Airmen, retired from the U.S. Air Force in 1970, a lieutenant general. Unique to the Buffalo Soldier Regiments was the appointment of a regimental chaplain in addition to their spiritual duties, the education of the troops, many of whom were illiterate, was a primary function. In 1884, Henry V. Plummer became the first black chaplain in the regular army. His assignment, Fort Riley, Kansas, the 9th Cavalry. Within a few years, he had established himself as a role model to the troopers, but like Lieutenant Flipper before him, he fell victim to prejudice. He was court-martialed and dismissed from the army. One of the charges? fraternizing with enlisted men. In 1886, Alan Allensworth, a Civil War veteran who as a slave had taught himself the forbidden arts of reading and writing, became the second black chaplain. He would spend the next two decades with the black troopers as one of the Army's most innovative and devoted educators. 
At Fort Bayard, New Mexico, Allensworth wrote a manual which was to set the standard course of studies for the common soldier throughout the army. His success led to the appointment of three more black chaplains, William T. Anderson, Theophilus G. Stewart, and George W. Perlow. Allensworth retired in 1906 as a lieutenant colonel, the highest ranking black officer of his day. Formal education was important, but fighting was the primary duty of the Buffalo Soldiers. Dr. Monroe Billington, author of New Mexico's Buffalo Soldiers. In the years following the Civil War, the territory of New Mexico had 16 military installations. At 11 of those, black soldiers served at one time or another between 1866 and 1900. Those men were out here for a specific purpose. Their primary job was to pacify the Indians, to make New Mexico territory a place to live in, safe for whites and Hispanics and other peoples who wanted to come out to this country. And while there were some white soldiers in New Mexico as well as blacks, there's no question that the blacks made a significant contribution in this area. Pacification of the Indians, their number one goal. And they spent a great deal of time working at that, some of them losing their lives, Others spending time doing other things when they were not chasing Indians, but to help the others do their jobs. And in that regard, these soldiers made a significant contribution to the settlement of New Mexico. The black soldiers in New Mexico were not uh, only interested in uh, the Indians, nor was all the violence in, with which they were associated uh, did it have to do with the Indians. The army was also used for pacifying civil disturbances, as well as the Indians. And it turns out that the black soldiers in New Mexico played an important role in New Mexico's most famous series of events. That's the Lincoln County War in the late 1870s. And the black soldiers were brought in by the colonel at, uh, at uh, Fort Stanton near Lincoln, New Mexico. And there, uh, by coming down on one side or the other, he was able to bring the Lincoln County War to an end. Most people know that he played a role in it. They do not know that black soldiers were those who backed him up. And so the black soldiers played a role in pacifying New Mexico for, uh, in purposes of the white population as well. The 9th Cavalry was making itself known in New Mexico. This badly faded tintype is our only link with this historic moment. Sergeant Thomas Shaw from Covington, Kentucky, for meritorious courage under fire, the highest decoration the country could award, the Medal of Honor. No pictorial record remains to show Sergeant George Jordan from Williamson County, Tennessee, in the same action with Shaw, the Medal of Honor. Sergeant John Denny from Big Flats, New York, Las Animas Canyon, New Mexico, 1879, for removing a wounded comrade to a place of safety while under heavy fire, the Medal of Honor. Sergeant Brent Woods, a farmer from Pulaski County, Kentucky, in Gavilan Canyon, New Mexico, the Medal of Honor. The cavalry and some civilians were trapped. Their officer was killed. Old Woods took command. He said it was his energy and skill that defeated the Indians and saved the detachment from a massacre. He was some soldier. But then he got busted down to private but they never did try to take that Medal of Honor. The 24th and 25th Infantry would spend 11 years in the frontier wilderness of Texas, stretched thin along a border hundreds of miles long. Forts Davis, Stockton, Quitman, McCabot, and Clark. They built the roads, the forts, the telegraph lines, guarded wagon trains, and stagecoaches. In the early years, the 9th Cavalry would join them at Davis and Stockton. This was raw, remote, violent land, a threshold of American civilization. Indians, bandits, and Mexican revolutionaries raided, robbed, and murdered almost at will. The Buffalo soldiers were the settlers' only hope for protection. The 10th Cavalry began its history in Kansas. Organized at Fort Leavenworth, they would spread across the plains at Fort Harker, Fort Hayes, Fort Larned. Their war was a different one. 
Marauding Cheyenne and Kiowa, considered by many officers to be the finest light cavalry in the world, were the masters of the plains. The ill-equipped and hastily trained buffalo soldiers would prove to be their equal and more. One of the most valued documents of the buffalo soldier period is the journal kept by Sergeant Horace Bivens, shown here with his dog Booth. The son of a farmer in Virginia, Bivens attended Hampton School, and quoting his journal, having a very great desire for adventure and to see the Wild West, I joined the United States Army. Assignment, the 10th Cavalry, Fort Grant, Arizona Territory, and his final station, Fort Apache. The Indian War in the Southwest was nearly over, but Bivens still had his taste of adventure. Chasing hostiles, patrolling roads and reservations, and protecting settlers was a full-time job. Bivens West was still wild. His interest in marksmanship led to his eventual reputation as one of the best shots in the Army, and the medals on his uniform attest to his skill. An officer of the 10th wrote to Washington requesting a better duty station for the regiment after nearly 20 years in the desert. He suggested somewhere closer to civilization, like Kansas. And the regiment was transferred to Montana. They arrived during a blizzard at 20 below zero. They would remain there until the war with Spain. The 9th Cavalry would also be transferred to the Northern Plains. In 1890, patrols from the 9th were searching for Chief Bigfoot and his band of Sioux when the 7th Cavalry encountered them at Wounded Knee. The day after that battle, the 7th was trapped by another band of warriors. Outnumbered and facing annihilation, they sent for help. A forced march of over 100 miles in a single day brought the 9th Cavalry to the rescue. Custer's former regiment, saved by the very men he had declined to serve with, the Buffalo Soldiers. That battle earned the final Medal of Honor for the 9th Cavalry. It went to Corporal William O. Wilson for bravery. During their years on the frontier, 12 men of the 9th earned the coveted medal. And sadly, no pictures exist for most of them. Sergeant Emanuel Stance, Corporal Clinton Greaves, Sergeant Thomas Boyne, Sergeant John Denny, Sergeant George Jordan, Sergeant Henry Johnson, Sergeant Thomas Shaw, First Sergeant Moses Williams, Sergeant Brent Woods, Sergeant William McBriar, Corporal William O. Wilson, Private Augustus Wally. The last man on this list, Augustus Wally, was one of the first Buffalo soldiers. He retired after 30 years of combat service. At the start of World War I, when the romance of the frontier had faded, this Indian fighter and winner of the Medal of Honor was recalled into the Army and promoted to first sergeant of a sanitation battalion in Louisiana. In 1889, two members of the 24th Infantry would join the Medal of Honor list. While escorting the paymaster in eastern Arizona, Sergeant Benjamin Brown and Corporal Isaiah May, wounded and outnumbered by bandits, responded in the highest traditions of the service, the Medal of Honor. The battleship Maine, anchored in the harbor at Havana, Cuba, to protect American interests during Cuba's rebellion against Spanish rule. On February 15, 1898, a massive explosion rocked the ship, and it went to the bottom with 266 members of its crew. Hastily blaming the incident on Spain, America declares war. For the first time, all four black regular army units will be together. The troops are transported to Chickamauga Park, Georgia, then to Tampa, Florida for embarkation. Having spent all their years on the frontier, the Jim Crow laws they encountered in the South came as a terrible shock. Sergeant Horace Bivens, 10th Cavalry, quoting again from his journal. We left Fort Assiniboine, Montana by train. We received great ovations all along the line. As we neared the South, the great demonstrations became less fervent. Some station waiting rooms read, white waiting room only. It was a revelation to us. Lieutenant John J. Pershing, 10th Cavalry, was witness to the ugly incidents, the beatings, shootings, and near riots. The Wilderness Warriors' reintroduction to civilized society. Jim Crow took full force in 1890. It was so bad that uh, I would say black people suffered 
more during the 90s and in the first uh, 10 or 15 years of the 20th century than at least they had suffered um, after the Civil War or just prior to the Civil War. It was a bad time. The National Association for the National Colored People was founded in 1910. That's not a coincidence. Their training was brief, and available transport was in short supply. The horses must be left behind. The cavalry would fight on foot in Cuba. The ports of Siboney and Daiquiri are chosen for troop landings. Their target, the city of Santiago. This film was taken by Thomas Edison's company as they landed. This authentic footage shows the 24th Infantry marching on Santiago. It was called the Splendid Little War, perhaps only by Theodore Roosevelt and his first volunteer cavalry, his Rough Riders. The first skirmish took place soon after landing at a place called Las Guasimas. The 10th Cavalry and the Rough Riders made short work of it. The next objective, the town of El Cane, three miles from Santiago. Pinned down by heavy fire, the 71st New York refuses to advance. Behind them, units of the 24th and 25th Infantry, Buffalo soldiers and eager, surge past the 71st. The town falls in a fierce battle. By now, units are mixed and intermingled. Santiago is surrounded by a long, high ridge. The highest points on the ridge, some 150 feet high and ringed with blockhouses and barbed wire, are called Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill. Everyone fights bravely, but when the flag is planted on San Juan, it is planted by Sergeant George Berry of the 10th Cavalry. He also planted the flag of the 3rd, which he took from its wounded bearer on the way up. In the assault, the Rough Riders were flanked by the 9th and 10th Cavalry. Contemporary newspapers gave much of the credit to the Buffalo soldiers. So did Roosevelt, and told reporters, I'll have much to say about them later, and he did. When he was running for office, Roosevelt said he had to force the black troopers up at gunpoint. Roosevelt was elected governor of New York as a result of San Juan Hill. Six members of the 10th Cavalry were elected to join the ranks of winners of the Medal of Honor. Private Dennis Bell, Private Fitz Lee, Private William H. Hopkins, Private George H. Wanton, Sergeant Major Edward L. Baker, Private Charles Cantrell. During the fighting, an epidemic of yellow fever ravaged the troops. Hospital volunteers were called for. To a man, the 24th Infantry volunteered, and many of them fell sick and died along with the men they were treating. A famous sketch of the time shows Sergeant Bivens Dog Booth mourning over the dead body of a friend. Got this note from a buddy of mine, old Carter, long time ago. Been carrying it in my pocket ever since. Let me read it to you. First Sergeant Carter Smith, 10th Cavalry. I noticed that both white and colored soldiers had a brotherly affection for each other while on the way to Cuba. In Cuba and on the way back to the United States. They got along nicely together. During the whole campaign, I never heard a crossword passed between them. Why can't it be so at home? Maybe tomorrow. The 19th century was at a close, as were the wars on the western frontier. And so, too, was the 30-year legend of the Buffalo Soldier. In Indian Territory, soon to become the state of Oklahoma, they protected the resident tribes. They also built Fort Sill. These photographs show Colonel Grierson and his troopers surveying Medicine Bluff outside the fort. They drove out the Boomers, bands of settlers who for years tried to illegally invade the territory. 
In the desert heat of the Southwest, they fought their way along the trails that are now major highways and made those states safe for settlement. In later years, as the fighting gradually subsided, there was time for recreation. Hunting was useful both as a sport and as a way to improve the regimental diet. Intercompany sports, such as this tug of war, were popular. And since Abner Doubleday was briefly commanding officer of the 10th Cavalry, perhaps that explains the troop interest in the sport of baseball. Football was also gaining great acceptance. And although not strictly a sport, as shown here in 1896 at Yellowstone Park, the troopers experimented with bicycles as a possible means of troop transport. In civilian life, Colonel Grierson was once a music teacher. Searching out the raw talent in his 10th Cavalry, Grierson arranged to buy instruments, taught the men, formed a regimental band. Both the officers and men contributed to the funding of the band. Not only a morale booster for the men, concert appearances and holiday parades in towns outside the forts helped the troops gain popularity with the civilians. July 25th, 1992, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Commander Carlton Philpot, United States Navy, the man who led the 10-year drive to complete the memorial, presents it officially to the Army. I wanted you and the rest of the world to know this is not a one-person project. It is not a Leavenworth project. It is a national project that we're turning over you to you, the Army, to maintain and upkeep with tender, loving care, sir. As you look at the sculpture and as you look at the piece, please see within that the things that we were trying to symbolize here. I would like it to be a new beginning for the generations coming up. And oftentimes they tell you, the new generation, that this is an era of cynicism. But don't believe them, because the light at the end of the tunnel is a new dawn rising. And your generation is that new dawn. And the greatest legacy we could leave to you at this time is a tangible reference point that you can see that you were a part of this. You were a part of the development of America. And no one race or group did this, but we all did it together. In honor of the day, the 302nd Fighter Squadron, the unit of the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II. And a salute to the man who dreamed more than 10 years ago that a moment like this could become a reality. The highest ranking military officer in the United States, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Colin Powell. The general reads from Grayson's farewell letter to his troops. The officers and enlisted men have cheerfully endured many hardships and privations and in the midst of great dangers, steadfastly maintained the most gallant and zealous devotion to duty. And they may well be proud of the record made and rest assured that the hard work undergone and the accomplishment of such important and valuable service to their country cannot fail sooner or later to meet with due recognition and reward. Benjamin H. Grierson, Colonel, 10th United States Cavalry. And now, 104 years later, on July 25th, 1992, his dream of recognition and reward has finally come true. And so has my dream. Beginning with the Buffalo Soldiers in 1866, African Americans would henceforth always be in uniform, challenging the conscience of a nation, posing the question of how could they be allowed to defend the cause of freedom, to defend the nation, if they themselves were to be denied the benefits of being Americans. The great liberator Frederick Douglass made the same point. Douglass said, 
once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters U.S. Let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket and there is no power on earth which can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship in the United States of America. So look at this statue. Look at him. Imagine him in his coat of blue on his horse, a soldier of the nation, eagles on his buttons, crossed sabers on his canteen, a rifle in his hand, a pistol on his hip, courageous, iron-willed. He was every bit the soldier that his white brother was. He showed that the theory of inequality must be wrong. He could not be denied his right. It might take time, it did take time, but he knew that in the end, he could not be denied. And the Buffalo soldiers were not the only ones in this struggle. The 24th and the 25th Infantry Regiments, the 92nd and 93rd Infantry Divisions, the high-flying Tuskegee Airmen, the parachuting Triple Nichols, our Navy's Golden 13, the Montford Point Marines, and thousands of other brave black Americans have gone in harm's way for their country since the days of the Buffalo Soldier, always moving forward and upward, step by step, sacrifice by sacrifice. But we are not here today to criticize an America of 150 years ago, but to rejoice, to rejoice that we live in a country that has permitted a spiritual descendant of the Buffalo Soldier to stand before you today as the first African-American chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I am deeply mindful of the debt I owe to those who went before me. I climbed on their backs. I will never forget their service and their sacrifice. And I challenge every young person here today, don't forget their service and sacrifice. Don't forget our service and sacrifice and climb on our backs to be eagles. So the powerful purpose of this monument must be to motivate us, to motivate us to keep struggling until all Americans have an equal seat at our national table, until all Americans enjoy every opportunity to excel, every chance to achieve their dream, limited only by their imagination and their own ability. We will leave this beautiful monument site today knowing that caring Americans made a modest dream come true. But let us also leave, my friends, determined that the most important dream in the world, the American dream of progress and full equality, has gained today with this monument a new vision, a new strength, and a new tomorrow. I sure wish those guys could have been here to see this. You know, maybe they was. And so, 126 years after the birth of the Buffalo Soldier legend, an old, old debt is finally paid. A magnificent but simple memorial to a band of warriors who kept the faith and whose contribution helped us to inherit a country.